The exhibition itself is part of a larger group of exhibitions called Home of Metal, um, which is a celebration, I suppose, of both the West Midlands and um, heavy metal music, really, and the connection between the two. Um, specifically about how um, heavy metal music has influenced all kinds of sort of all kinds of social activity and artistic practice. I mean, I think um, heavy metal music is something that has kind of featured um, in quite abstract ways in my work over a number of years. So perhaps it's not kind of that visible in terms of images, but in terms of some of the ideas um, specifically to do with the way language might be used or distorted or broken up. Um, it's, it's kind of been an influence. Um, I spoke here uh, four years ago now, actually, at the first conference on the, the Home of Metal conference, um, which Capsule organised, who organised the, the larger Home of Metal um, festival. And uh, I mean, again, that was specifically about the influence of kind of metal and, and rock music on, um, on visual art. Um, one of the themes that runs through the show is the idea of um, noise and silence and the relationship between those or the tension between um, bet between the moment of kind of making a sound or um, so the the idea with this piece or this this pair of works is to have something which um, like in theory should kind of produce this kind of big hefty sound it's a very large piece of um, fairly kind of brutal steel and I was quite interested in, in like I say creating something which had this kind of big kind of physical presence but also was kind of neutered in a way so it, it never makes a sound I mean I chose the kind of wind chimes because generally they're this sort of nice kind of twinkly calming so the idea of this would it, it would sound like a kind of I don't know thunder crash or something or something um, but of course they stay silent because um, well it's, it would take a large kind of wind to move something this heavy so there's something kind of inherently ridiculous of, about about the work and also it's part of a pair which pretty much look exactly the same um, other than the length of the chimes is, is slightly different. So the idea is that visually they're very similar, but actually they, if they were to make a sound, they'd make a, a different sound. One is tuned theoretically to a D major chord and the other to a D minor. And um, I suppose the D major is quite often found, found in kind of in marches and is, is sometimes called the chord of glory. It's very sort of bombastic kind of sound, whereas D minor is often kind of used in kind of melancholic kind of. So although they don't make a sound, they kind of contain within them this kind of potential. And I suppose that's something that comes out in the, the video um, LIB, which is, uh, again, a film of a performance which was about producing sound, but with the sound removed. So you see all of the mechanism, the throat and the, the, the mouth and the tongue that produce sound, but kind of there's, there's nothing there. I think... Um, Be Angry But Don't Stop Breathing was um, a work that I produced um, about five years ago, no, more than that, um, a while ago, <laughs> um, for the Art Now Space at Tate Britain, and the idea with that was the work was a kind of um, a group device, like a group therapy device in which viewers were invited to scream into this kind of chamber. Um, I was quite interested in sort of having moved on a little bit with my work since then, I was quite interested in that particularly the performative aspect of what happens when you invite um, someone to have a kind of open opportunity to speak in a public space. Um, so really it's a public address system with a microphone attached to it which allows kind of visitors and members, uh, members of staff to speak or well, not speak or to communicate, to like throw their voice into parts of the gallery in quite a loud way. Um, so there's an element of chance. I don't really know what's going to come up with that. Um, again, this tension between sort of silence and, and potential for noise. Um, 
but yeah, I think part of the idea really with placing that next to the, the video of Nick was that it would act as a kind of like kind of organic soundtrack for this kind of silence in the room next door. Bruise Block was a work that um, I was the first work that I thought about as a new work for the show, and that largely came about first of all just because of the architecture of the room, and I was interested in this sort of monolithic structure as, that you pass through into in the other galleries. So I kind of quite early on decided that I was going to build a wall, <laughs> as it were, kind of here to emphasise this structure. Um, and it, was, it, was a, it was a work that actually kind of moved quite a lot as, as I was working on it. Um, my initial idea was actually it was going to be like a dry stone wall, um, and on each of the stones it would have um, kind of word a text etched, etched into it and I was kind of interested in these these um, something called neologisms which are basically kind of made up or new words that you can create by adding two words together um, and something that was kind of I don't know I was particularly interested in the sort of Paul Solan's poetry and the way that he um, did that but also that it was a way that a lot of kind of metal bands seem to generate their names. So you quite often would find these kind of names made of two parts. Like, for instance, if you look at the kind of Home of uh, Metal show, I mean, you, for example, there's like God Flesh, um, Napalm Death, or um, uh, Diamond Head, or, <laughs> and they, so I started collecting, and, and the, the breeze block thing came actually out of that, because it was, that in itself was like these two words together and I started thinking about trying to make these words up which related specifically to sound. So the idea, so as soon as I thought of this breeze block thing and I also kind of liked just how there was this rudimentary, like if you want to, you know, the most simple kind of building structure of breeze block wall. Um, so the idea was that each brick would have this kind of neologism about sound written into it and in the end I decided to make it work graphically that each brick would have three of these words kind of etched into it and the first version of it was done um, like a kind of engraving so it looked almost like a gravestone and I wasn't really happy with that so then I kind of decided that it would be more interesting um, to kind of etch it in like handwriting so it became more like um, an activity as it were and Basically, I did that, and it was like three, three or thousand or something. So, and and then, I still wasn't really happy with it. So I then went through this process of crossing them out, and then again, still felt slightly frustrated by it. And the final version, which you kind of see here, the text is kind of mirrored over the top of itself, um, and it becomes this kind of quite sort of a difficult to to decipher kind of mark. Um, so there's this sort of again this kind of cancelling out or negation of the idea of sound and um, I suppose in terms of making it, it was something that sort of, when this relates to metal, this sort of element of nihilism which is spending a lot of time doing something and then basically destroying it. Um, but in terms of the way it looks, the two things I was really thinking about were the kind of some logos that you find with a lot of um, kind of black metal and extreme metal bands which tend to use this kind of symmetrical, quite indecipherable kind of fonts. And also um, something called dutching, which is like basically, um, it's like a type of graffiti based on sort of scratching. I kind of find it quite a lot on sort of bus windows and stuff in, in <laughs> London. But it's like, it's kind of like taking like a name or a tag or something to the point where again, it just becomes this sort of code. Um, yeah, Ergo Agot um, is a kind of, installation work but it's um they use this sort of mechanical sculpture and, and, and video um and i suppose it's based on the idea of um optical illusion and it uses two kind of optical effects um one is this kind of black and white these black and white spinning discs um, and they are based on the record label for vertigo records in, in in the sort of 70s late 60s onwards um, which famously um, kind of put out the early Black Sabbath albums um, and I for me that's quite interesting because it was one of the first examples of op art that actually I ever saw when I was a kid with these these record labels on the um, Black, early Black Sabbath well specifically the first one I saw was on an album called uh, Master of Reality and 
that um, it kind of produces this kind of void. And to me, there's a sort of real connection between the music and, and that kind of um, that visual kind of void. And, um, but also the idea of kind of op art filtering down to something commercial I and mean, sort of the, lo the label itself is based on Duchamp's rotor reliefs, which um, were an attempt to produce a commercial artwork, which he tried to sell at a trade fair, which actually didn't work at all. So it's kind of, I like the kind of irony that it ended up actually being something very commercial um, as, as this record label. I mean, it uses another optical effect as well, um, which is to do with putting different size circles together and then changing size. And um, when I was putting that work together, it was around the time there was a fairly big kind of tabloid campaign against a human rights act. And um, I was quite interested in the idea of um, how you might, and, and this relates to the idea of illusion, you might think you're in a particular situation which is very, very safe and protected, but actually that in itself might not be true. And by the time you realize that that's an illusion, you kind of realize that you're kind of on the edge of the cliff and there's nowhere mm -hmm. to go. And so the video component of the work relates to, shows a series of dates and they relate to um, Acts of Parliament, which had already been passed in 2006, which already um, kind of eroded certain parts, parts of the Human Rights Act. So um, I suppose the idea of that work is to sort of illustrate a situation or to create a sort of sense of unease or kind of disorientation in the viewer that kind of relates to something which is social or something which, you know, a, a world situation. These um, metal reliefs, I suppose, are quite a new series of works and kind of came out of a series of digital works, I suppose, I've been working on probably for about 12 years now, which use kind of um, found text um, that come from all kinds of different sources. And I suppose in terms of language, I'm, with these works, I'm interested in what happens when you kind of make very bold, open-ended statements and separate them from the person who said them. So they kind of can become quite um, meaningless. And I suppose I'm, the idea really is to sort of, although they're very graphic or, um, and there's a lot going on visually, I, I suppose in a way, again, I was trying to describe a kind of silence. So you kind of have a situation where you have something which is so open or so on the surface. So these works, there's a lot going on, there's a lot to kind of look at, that in a way, um, like some of the surfaces are very reflective, so it's actually quite difficult to actually grasp them. They kind of drift in and out a bit. So I've kind of wanted something which is um, describing this sort of ecstatic moment of someone saying, saying something to you, and you're thinking, yeah, that's it. And you kind of turn off all the bits of your brain which for a second, which are the ones which kind of like are to do with thinking why, well, why, actually maybe not. So it's a kind of like that moment of ecstatic kind of acceptance of language. Um, I mean, the, the works in the show come from, uh, I mean, the texts come from all sorts of different sources. There's one which is um, based uh, on some poetry. There's one which comes from a speech from um, Bill Clinton's inauguration. Um, and I tend to sort of try and use language which is quite simple to understand, so quite simple words, but quite kind of big, open, mm -hmm. open messages. I mean, um, I mean, I tend to work a lot with digital processes, even with the metal relief, and I do it you know, with video and printing and stuff. Um, and I try to counter that by making work which is quite um, kind of handmade, because I'm quite interested in the idea of like digital art being um, like a contemporary version of craft. So it's kind of something which is kind of done at home. It can be quite a kind of domestic cottage kind of industry, as it as it were. And um, the carvings are kind of like the kind of opposite of that. They're supposed to complement each other, so they're very very much handmade. Whereas the digital works, no hands really ever touch them as such. They're kind of made by machines. Um, I mean, in terms of burning them, I mean, that 
was really, when I first made those works, like the first, very first one I made from that series is in the show, it's called uh, 2012 Love Dot, and it was based on the Olympic logo. And that, I made a whole body of work which was to do with the idea of, well, to do with the Olympics and the idea of manufacturing history. And a lot of the works, I wanted a lot of the works to look like they'd been around for a long time or been dug out the ground and so I, I, it was a way of kind of aging them I just mm -hmm. sort of set fire to it and then whilst I was doing that I actually kind of felt very um, I liked it as a sort of mark making this is sort of really satisfying way of making a mark and also um, the slightly absurd thing of spending like a lot of time doing something really laborious and then just not really knowing what's going to happen when you set fire to it there's a sort of mm -hmm. destruction and creation kind of involved. I mean, there's some um, smaller sculptural works in the show, which again, I mean, kind of exist as these kind of, they're very kind of crafted, um, um, wood carved sculptures, again, featuring these wind chimes. One of them has this, um, and they, they're, they're kind of, they were made to complement the very large kind of brutal steel structures. and. One of them, um, a piece called uh, Chimes of Glory, is a kinetic work, and, but in a very sort of minor way. So it, it spins for one second every five minutes and it kind of sets these very, very small little wind chimes off which make a kind of really pathetic kind of tinkling noise. And I suppose I quite like the idea of having these massive wind chimes which don't make any sound and then periodically you have this really delicate little kind of sound that sound that happens.